Okay, the divide. So this is, so Felix is the main character, and this is his translation. So from the world that he finds, they speak Tangle, or they use Tangle. And so he's going to translate it translate it into English. So Brazel is a griffin. So these are all like mythological creatures. Brittlehorn is a unicorn. Creepy biter, no parallel. Parasitic invertebrae. Cuddy yak, no parallel. A yak buffalo with rhino horn. A diggly luck is a gnome. Fire breather is a dragon. Flame bird is a phoenix. Human galley is an elephant. Jappergrin is a pixie. Licket, no parallel. Elvish cookery experts. I don't even know what that means. No horn, horse. Ragamucky is a brownie. River fatty is a hippopotamus. Shredder mouth, there's no parallel. Or it's a crocodile with longer legs. Um, a sinistrum is a devil hyena. A small tail is a fawn. Tangle person, elf. Triple head, rock. Vampire, vampire. Wise hoof, centaur. Warrit, no parallel. Dog with comic appearance. So you'll be seeing all of these characters. Okay, chapter one. The rat-tat-tat of the helicopter's rotor blades scattered the hummingbirds across the, the study center garden as though someone had thrown a handful of jewels into the air. Felix watched as a stretcher was carried across the lawn. The man lying on it had been bitten by so many insects that his face was puffed up like a toad's. His skin was an angry copper color, and it was peeling away in little patches. It took us a week to find him, said Miguel. He strayed off the path into the jungle. That is forbidden, of course. It is so easy to get lost. Does this happen a lot? Asked Felix's mother. Miguel smiled. No. Is only the third time since I work. Here. He saw an armadillo, so he followed it. A very foolish thing to do. The man on the stretcher let out a brief cry of pain as he was loaded into the helicopter. I'm not so sure about doing this walk after all, said Felix's mother. You have taken your pills, haven't you, Felix? Felix sighed, yes. And you did fill up your water bottle? Yes. And you got the, the map? Felix opened the, his bag and it showed it to her. Nestled between the book he was currently reading, his flashlight, his notebook, and his ballpoint pen. And the compass, queried his father. Felix patted his chest. The tiny instrument was hung around his neck, but it was inside his t-shirt. The helicopter door slammed shut and the stretcher bearers made their way back across the lawn, shaking their heads and talked animatedly in Spanish. Felix looked at Miguel. Is that man going to die? Felix's parents glanced at each other. Miguel ruffled Felix's hair. What a question. He is dehydrated. He will be all right once he gets to the hospital. I don't think we'll do the whole walk, said Felix's mother. Felix isn't up to four and a half hours in this heat. But you have to go as far as the Continental Divide, said Miguel. How old are you, Felix? Eleven? Twelve? Thirteen, said Felix. He's not like other boys, said Felix's mother. He has a very rare heart condition, an unusual blood type. Sometimes he passes out. We have to be careful. Oh, said Miguel, and there was something a bit different about Felix. A sort of grayness under the tan. He was small for his age, and thin, too but his eyes were a deep, startling blue, and they seemed too old for the rest of his face. But I pestered them and pestered them to take me somewhere exciting before I died, said Felix. There was a horrible silence. Then Felix's father said, You mustn't think like that, Felix. You've held up surprisingly well for the last few days. Yes, thought Felix. I'm always better when I'm not thinking about it. And Costa Rica has been amazing. Volcanoes, mangrove swamps, lizards, parrots... I don't want to go home. If I do have to die, I'd rather die here than anywhere else. The helicopter took off and the hummingbirds returned to the sugar water feeders that were hung around the outside of the study center. They used their beaks as rapiers, fencing in midair as they tried to knock one another away from the rim. The ones that won looked smug and the ones that lost zoomed around the garden pretending they didn't want to drink after all. Come on then, said Felix's father, before it gets too hot. They started out along the path. The canopy closed above them like the roof of a cathedral. And when they looked up, 
They could see flowers growing between the branches. It was as though they had been made out of tissue paper and stuck on with glue. What pretty trees, said Felix's mother. The flowers are epiphets, said Felix, who had read far more than most boys his age. He did a lot of reading, because for a, a lot of the time he couldn't do much else, and he particularly liked things about science. Epiphets are parasitic plants, he added. Oh, said his mother. Like that strangler fig, Felix went on, pointing to a tangle of aerial roots. The tree inside dies in the end. Then he felt a little ashamed of himself. When his parents became too protective, he always lashed out the way, the only way he knew how, by mentioning death. They walked along for a while in silence. There wasn't as much to see as he expected, but he could hear the strange ringing call of a bellbird, which made him think of the little church in the village where they were staying. There were plenty of insects, though, a morpho butterfly the size of a saucer, its wings the most astonishing metallic blue, an ant's nest full of hollowed-out chambers. Don't go any closer, said Felix's mother. They probably have a nasty sting. How are you feeling, dear? Tired? No, said Felix, and he wasn't. He wanted to get as far as the Continental Divide, wanted to say he'd stood with one foot on either side. They were going uphill all the time now. The view was going to be magnificent when they reached the top. Jungle on one side and jungle on the other, straight down to the Pacific. And then he did begin to feel tired. He could see from the map that they didn't have very far to go. But his mother was looking at him with that worried expression that irritated him so much. And then, predictably, she said, I think we should turn back now. And his father nodded. No, said Felix. Don't argue, said his father. But I want to get to the divide. What's so special about it, said his mother. It's the watershed, Felix, Felix explained. All the water on one side goes into the Atlantic, and all the water on the other goes into the Pacific. So? Felix gritted his teeth. She didn't understand. It was such a cool idea. Bodies were 70% water. If he could separate himself out the way he separated things out in the laboratory at school, half of him would go one way and half of him the other. It's just an imaginary line, said his father. There's nothing to see. Felix glanced back at his mother. She was wriggling her shoulders, and then she turned her head to look behind her. Felix followed her gaze. There, on her back, was an insect the size of a pencil. Get it off me, she shrieked. Felix grinned. It was a stick insect. Even though it was much bigger than the ones at school, it wouldn't hurt her. David, she yelled at his father. Do something. Felix knew his father wouldn't kill it. He would try to lift it off and it wouldn't be easy. He edged away just for once. He was going to do what he wanted. He saw his father grasp the stick insect around its middle and try to pull it off. The legs clung to the fabric like Velcro. Felix edged a bit further. Neither of his parents had noticed. His father lifted one of the insect's feet off the blouse, then another and another. By the time he reached the fourth leg, the first foot was back on the fabric again. Felix was nearly at the bend in the path. A few more steps and he'd be out of sight. What are you doing, yelled Felix's mother. Asking it nicely, it won't work. The moment Felix reached the bend, he ran. It was hard work, running uphill, but suddenly there it was, the top. It hadn't been very far at, away at all. The view was just as breathtaking as he imagined. The Pacific stretched into the distance, shining silver where the sun caught it. He turned his attention to the ground. The line of the divide had been marked out, and there was a sign next to it explaining about catchment boundaries and water conservation. He walked over to the line and stood with his feet on either side of it, exactly the way he wanted to. And there, and that was when the dizziness returned. He knew he really had done too much. He was going to pass out. The feeling was so familiar, the ringing in his ears, the slight sickness in his stomach, and although he was able to recognize the sensations, the recognition always flashed through his mind like lightning, and there was never anything he could do about it. And then, blackness. Squelch! The pond hopper jumped half a meter to the left and glared at her. Bettany sighed. Why couldn't she get this right? She'd placed the goblet of water in the middle of the circle, and she had the salt in her left hand. She tried again, trickling the salt through her fingers and muttering the incantation. Squelch! This time the pond hopper jumped right out of the circle and scuttled behind the statue that had once been Bettany's mother. Bettany scowled. 
She'd done everything right. Why hadn't it worked? Bettany, what? We're off now. Bettany scuffed the circle into oblivion as quickly as she could and hid the salt in her pocket. Then she walked across the yard to the rope ladder and peered up into the tree. Off? Where to? Tear tattle. Tear tattle? How long are you going to be gone? A week or so, said Bettany's older sister, Tansy. We did tell you. No, you didn't, said Bettany. I'm sure we did, said Tansy. Tansy always reminds me of a stabber bird, thought Bettany with her long nose and her snacky neck. Who's going to look after me, she demanded. Ramson, called Tansy. Did you ask Grisette if Bettany could stay with her? I thought you had, said Ramson, trying to cram some herbs into a bag and spilling them onto the ground. Ramson had to be the clumsiest brother ever. It was as though his body had suddenly become too big for him over the last year or so, and he couldn't control all of it at once. Honestly, Ramsey, it was your turn to sort all that out, said Tansy. There isn't time to go and see her now. The flight leaves in ten minutes. Look, said Tansy to Bettany, tell Grisette we'll make it up to her when we get back. We're going to make some real money with this tooth potion. It's perfect. I doubt it, thought Bettany. Our parents never managed to. What makes you think that a couple of teenagers living in rickety wooden treehouse on the edge of nowhere are going to do any better? She climbed up the ladder, avoiding the wobbly rung, and stomped up the spiral staircase. The steps were made from sawed-off branches on the main trunk, and only a few of them had been sanded down. The house always reeked of sawdust and resin, apart from the dispensary, which smelled of dried herbs and magic. She went into her room and packed her backpack. It wasn't the first time she'd done this. It wasn't even the third or fourth time. She hated staying with Grisette. Grisette's daughter, Agrimine, Agrimony, seemed to think that having the latest of everything made her a better person somehow. That was a laugh, really, because they all lived here in Geddon, one of the most isolated communities of all. The children in the nearest town regarded them with contempt. As an afterthought, Bettany retrieved her secret hairbrush from under her bed, took off her cap, and brushed her pale blonde hair until it gleamed. That would annoy her sister. She hefted the backpack onto her shoulders and climbed down. You've forgotten the sickle, Ramson was saying. The sickle's your responsibility, dimwit, Tansy snapped. She glanced around. Then she did a double take. Bettany, she shrieked, what do you look like? Your hair? It feels really nice, said Bettany provocatively. It swings when I shake my head. You've got a hairbrush hidden somewhere, haven't you? Honestly, kids, Agrimony never brushes her hair. It's beautifully knotted. I don't care, said Bettany. I like it like this. Have a good time then, and don't forget to come back. Oh, honestly, said Tansy, resorting to her favorite word again. Bettany could have reminded them of the time they went away for two days and stayed away for two months, but she thought better of it. She settled her backpack more comfortably on her shoulders and walked off down the track toward the village. It was a beautiful day. She dutifully identified all the plants as she walked along. Then she thought, fangs and talons. I don't want to end up doing the same thing as my parents did. Ramson and Tansy seemed to enjoy making infusions to cure people, but it's not what I want to do. I want, I want, but she didn't quite know what it was that she wanted. Something different. She didn't want her life mapped out for her the way everyone else's was. Go to school, study boring subjects like nuts and berries, follow your parents into their chosen specialty, and where had it gotten them? Nowhere. She remembered the incident as though it had been yesterday, although it was three years ago now. The five of them had been standing in the yard, talking about the latest spell her father was testing. It's going to be a real winner, he said. Knits bones together and makes them as strong as stone last 20 years. As he spoke, there was a rumbling sound from the top of the lane. They all looked around. The family cart was trundling down the slight incline and gathering speed. You forgot to put the handbrake on again, yelled Bettany's mother. There was nothing anyone could do. As they watched the cart pass the gate and hit a tree, the tree toppled across the well and knocked the bucket from its hook. The bucket bounced across the yard and dislodged a pile of logs. The logs rolled in all directions, and as Bettany's father tried to stop them, he lost his footing and fell into the pond. When he climbed out, he was holding his arm, and his face was creased with pain. It's broken, he said. Well, use the spell, said Bettany's mother. 
but you haven't tested it properly yet, said Tansy, and you haven't worked out the counter charm if it goes wrong. It'll be fine, said Bettany's mother. She put her hand on her husband's arm and recited the incantation. And as the three children watched, their parents turned to stone. Ramsen looked at Tansy, a horrified expression on his face. What on earth do we do now? They're going to stay like that for 20 years. They look quite nice on either side of the rope ladder, said Tansy. Garden furniture, you know. Ramsen gulped. Come on, said Tansy, always a practical one. We can use the logs as rollers. And that was how Bettany ended up being brought up by her brother and sister. It seemed a bit odd to begin with, passing her parents every time she went up and down the ladder. She did miss them, of course, but after a while she got used to it. It wasn't as if they died. As Bettany continued walking, she suddenly thought, Grisette isn't expecting me. No one will know if I go exploring. She glanced around. There were dangers in the woods. Warts, brazzles, vampires. But there were flame birds and brittle horns as well. Agrimini said that she did that she had seen a brittle horn the previous week, but Bettany didn't believe her. Brittle horns were shy creatures, and they only spoke to the elders. Agrimony had a little notebook in which she jotted down the names of all the creatures she had seen and scored points for the more unusual ones. With a tingle of excitement, Bettany left the path, keeping the stream on her left so she wouldn't get lost. In the distance, she could see the peak of Tromfell. It was said to be very beautiful in a stark, rocky sort of way, but nobody went there because of the Brazzles. Brazzles were thought to be very clever. They hoarded gold, and rumor had it there was a treasure trove up there on the peak. No one who lived in Geddon had ever tried to find out. Brazzles were supposedly extremely fierce, and no one wanted their eyes pecked out. A song merchant had passed by once and said that Brazzles were in common sight in far-off Andrea, but nobody really believed him. Bettany started to sing. Brightly colored toadstools littered the forest floor, and she had to force herself not to trick not to tick their names off in her head i'm not going to be an herbalist she said to herself out loud i'm not i'm keeping my options open why don't we do interesting things at school like learning about the past no one seems to care about the past all that much only the song merchants the stream tinkled in a friendly sort of way and after a while she realized its source must be somewhere on tromfell because she was going uphill from time to time she thought she saw hoof prints, but she wasn't very good at tracking and she couldn't be sure. Supposedly, she really did see a brittle horn? That would be a poke in the eye for agronomy. And she, then she did. Bettany stopped dead in her tracks and rubbed her eyes. Perhaps agronomy hadn't been fibbing after all. It was lying down under a tree and lifted its head when it saw her. She expected it to leap to its feet and dash off through the undergrowth, but it didn't. She took a tentative step forward. The Brittleborn, Brittlehorn laid its head back down on the ground and just watched her. She took another step forward and saw its white flank twitch as a fly landed on it. Bettany swallowed. This wasn't the way things were meant to go. She walked right over and knelt beside it. The Brittlehorn sighed and said, I'm sick, tangled child. Bettany didn't know what to do. Finally, she said, Can I get you a drink of water or something? The Brittlehorn nodded. Bettany went over to the stream. and filled her cap with water. Then she went back to the brittle horn and held its head so that it could drink. Thank you, it said. What's your name? Silvershank. Yours? Bettany. You're a herbalist then, aren't you, Tangle Child? But even your knowledge cannot cure me now. Bettany felt dreadful. She didn't have any knowledge worth speaking of. She neglected her homework, didn't pay attention in class, and even played hooky from time to time. I'm not very good at medicine, she admitted. Maybe that's just as well, said Silvershank. He wasn't making sense. After a moment or two, all she could think of to say was, what are your symptoms? My horn aches and well, that happens, you know, your time is up. Do something for me. What? Go farther upstream to where my people are. Tell them not to take, not to take. But Silvershank never finished what he was going to say. His body shuddered as though some powerful thread were being stretched to its breaking point. Then his eyes closed, and the breath left his body in one last sigh. He's dead, thought Bettany. Dead. How awful. I couldn't do anything. 
I was absolutely useless. I found a brittle horn and I let him die. What do I do now? It's going to get dark in a couple of hours. If I took that unfinished message to his people, would it mean anything to them? But if they do know what he was talking about, it might stop the same thing from happening to another one. On the other hand, the only tangle folk the brittle horns talk to are the elders, and I'm just a kid. If they saw me, they'd probably run away. I'd be stuck out there overnight, and that's when the warts are on the prowl. Oh, blazing feathers, what a mess. She sat and looked at Silvershank, the ivory spiraling horn in the center of his forehead, the delicate cloven hooves, the white silk of his mane. She couldn't let his death go for nothing. She stood up and he heaved her backpack back onto her shoulders. Then she realized she had no proof that she'd seen Silvershank, apart from knowing his name, so she took out her knife, cut a few strands of hair from his mane, and put them in her backpack. After that, she whispered goodbye and started back along the path. It was going up more steeply now, and the shadows were lengthening. She was frightened. There were no two ways about it, but she was good at climbing trees, and warrants were ground-dwelling beasts. If she couldn't find Silvershank's people before dark, she would choose a nice big tree and make herself a nest in it.